Dear fellow redeemed, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for this day's proclamation is our gospel text, Matthew 2, verses 13 through 23. And we read again verses 14 and 15 in Jesus' name. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Dear Lord, you have planned out our salvation perfectly and accomplished it perfectly through your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith today and help us to see that you truly are in command of all things. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, happy fifth day of Christmas. Do you have your five golden rings? That's right. The old carol, The Twelve Days of Christmas, was talking about the days between December 25th and January 5th. That is, the days between Christmas and Epiphany. And the culmination of this season was the visit of the wise men to the baby Jesus and the revelation of the Savior to all the nations through them. However, if you go to a supermarket today, do you think they'll still be celebrating the Christmas season? In our modern day, the Christmas season tends to end at about midnight on December 25th. We've pushed back the Christmas season so far into the year that by the time Christmas actually rolls around, we're about ready for the Christmas season to end. The stores have already taken down their decorations and their Christmas trees and are ready for the new year. And our Christmas joy has just about petered out. Well, we can see in our text today that the first Christmas season was also cut short. But while our, our Christmas season is cut short by fatigue and by the rush of our modern society, the first Christmas was attacked by a paranoid king and was disrupted by a horrible tragedy. The Apostle St. Matthew points out something important about this tragedy, however. He shows us that this tragedy happened that it might be fulfilled, what the Lord had said. The Lord spoke two prophecies in our text today. He said that there would be lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. But he also said that out of Egypt I called my son. Now, let's take a closer look at the history surrounding our text today. When Joseph got this warning from the angel, he didn't wait until morning to get up and leave Bethlehem. No, the moment he arose, before dawn had even appeared on the horizon, he took Mary and the Christ child and escaped out of Bethlehem as fast as possible. Now, a message from an angel warning you about a danger to the child that Joseph already knew was his savior is more than enough reason to explain Joseph's haste here. But Joseph had another reason to hurry. He knew the character of Herod. Herod's monstrous qualities were well known while he was ruling in Judea. Put in place by the Roman government, Herod was arrogant, ambitious, and paranoid. He ruled Judea with an iron fist through fear and shows of force, and he was desperate to hold on to his kingdom by any means necessary. By this point in his life, Herod had already killed three of his wives and several of his sons in order to hold on to his power. One of his sons he killed with his own hands, drowning him in his own swimming pool. Legend has it that one of the children killed in this purge of Bethlehem was another of Herod's sons. If this is true, it isn't out of character for this power-mad king. And these children killed are just the first in something that the New Testament has warned us time and time again that would happen. That we Christians would be hated, persecuted, and killed for our faith. These children are the first Christian martyrs. The first innocents to suffer as a direct result of those persecuting Christ. They are not the last. Now, the persecution and suffering that Christians experience in the New Testament and beyond 
often mirrors the persecution and suffering that the Jews experienced in the Old Testament, as we can see in the quote from Jeremiah today. This passage is Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. The book of Jeremiah and of Lamentations, which was also written by the prophet Jeremiah, are tales of horror and woe. They chronicle some of the darkest times in ancient Jewish history, when the Babylonians came in and brought many of them into captivity. Ramah was the name of a small fort that was on the edge of Judah's territory. It was the last stop for some of the Jewish prisoners as they were taken away in ba into Babyl Babylonian captivity. Their last stay in the promised land before they were taken out of it for the rest of their lives. Rachel, the wife of Jacob, died in childbirth either near or at Bethlehem. Her weeping at that time was a type or foreshadowing of the weeping of the Bethlehem mothers in our text today. All in all, this is a very dark, depressing time in our Lord's history. But the Apostle St. Matthew gives us a ray of hope in this very quote by, uh, from Jeremiah. Because, you see, Jeremiah 31 is not a prophecy of doom and gloom. No, Jeremiah 31 is a message of comfort. Comfort to the remnant of Israel being taken away into Babylonian captivity. This message of comfort is more clearly seen in the next few verses. Jeremiah 31, verses 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. In the time Jeremiah wrote these words, they were a direct prophecy of the return of the Jewish children to Judah and to Israel, a return which happened more than 70 years after these words were spoken. The Apostle St. Matthew shows us today that these were also a prophecy that was fulfilled in our text today. As we can see, they mirror the words of Hosea 11, verse 1, where the Holy Spirit has caused the prophet Hosea to write, When Israel was a child, I loved him. That is, God loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The Apostle St. Matthew is known for his strong understanding and use of the Old Testament throughout his gospel. In the book of Matthew, we see time and time again that the birth, life, death, and resurrection of our Lord was planned out from the very beginning. Our salvation was planned for and prepared since the moment of the fall. Our omniscient Lord knew what was going to happen and planned for it well in advance. God constantly and consistently turns this world's evil into his good, just as he does in our text today. Hosea 11 verse 1 is speaking of God's great love for his chosen people, the people of Israel. But in the very next verses of Hosea, God once again laments Israel's unfaithfulness. God took Israel out of Egypt. He loved them as their father, and he protected and cared for them every day. And yet, they still turned away from him. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. God calling Israel out of Egypt was an imperfect fulfillment of this calling because Israel failed. But here in our text today, we can see the perfect fulfillment of this calling. Jesus, God, the Son of Man, fulfilled this calling perfectly and does what Israel is unable to do as God's perfect Son. We can see the personal stake that God had in our salvation in even the smallest details here in this single attempt and this single account of danger to the Christ child. An angel guided Joseph every step of the way, warning him, directing his steps, and ensuring the safety of Christ throughout this entire account. God had a personal stake in safeguarding our salvation and took care of it every step of the way. 
And this salvation in and of itself is personal. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived the perfect life for each and every one of us, fulfilling by his active obedience that which we were unable to fulfill. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, died on the cross bearing the weight of each and every one of our personal sins, paying the price by his passive obedience that we were unable to pay. From beginning to end, our salvation has been completely personal. And because of this salvation, we know that this world's hatred and persecution is only temporary. Our eternal salvation is utterly secure. God has everything in his hands, and he consistently turns this world's evil into his great good, even in the smallest details. We can see how detail-oriented our God is in the third prophecy that he fulfilled in our text today. He will be called a Nazarene. The word Nazarene comes from the uh, the Hebrew word for root or branch. Jesus is the shoot from the root of Jesse, the branch that comes out of David's line to save the whole world. Our God is so detail-oriented that he went so far as to prophesy what some people would call Jesus later in his life. God has planned out our salvation from the very beginning, all the way from creation and the birth and the visitation of Mary, all the way to the empty tomb on Easter Sunday, and even beyond that, all the way until Judgment Day. God consistently turns evil into good, And we can see this most strongly in the events surrounding the greatest good that he has given to us, the salvation of our souls. We can trust in the Lord this Christmas season, knowing that he is constantly working to protect and help us, and that he has already saved us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Because of this, our Christmas joy doesn't need to be cut short. We can celebrate the Christmas season all year round, rejoicing in the fulfillment of our God's promises to us and in the salvation of our souls from our sin. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto everlasting life. Amen.